Okay, why don't we get underway? We were expecting a few other attendees. Hopefully, they'll be able to join us in progress. Um, let me begin by saying good evening, everyone, and welcome to this virtual information session. And thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. I know that there are a lot of things that compete for your time and attention, particularly at this time of year. And your interest in this Grimsby Area Creeks floodplain mapping initiative, and of course in your community and in your own properties, is very much appreciated. Some of you have heard me say this before, but I do a fair bit of this kind of work, and it's my personal belief that people who like yourselves, who take time out of your busy personal and professional lives, to contribute constructively to matters of civic and societal interest are always most deserving of our gratitude and respect. So thank you again for joining us. And I look forward, as I'm sure to you, to a productive and constructive session. Let me introduce myself. For those of you whom I've not yet met, my name is Glenn Pache. I'm the head of a firm called GLPI. And it's my pleasure this evening to serve as the independent facilitator for the session. So again, it might be important for you to know that I am not an employee of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, that is the NPCA, nor am I an employee of any of the engineering firms that they've retained um, to assist them with this mapping initiative. The only bias I bring to the meeting, if you can call it a bias, is toward achieving the best result for us all, and that's what I will set out to do. I'll introduce a few others in a couple of minutes, but first let's talk about what it is that we are up to tonight. And as I think you likely all recognize, this study is important given that its outcomes will help protect both public and private property that is at risk from flooding. And more importantly, it will reduce risk to personal safety. And of course, managing flood risk begins with identifying the areas that are flood prone. So let's talk briefly about what we're up to. In just a few minutes, we'll have an overview presentation that's going to cover a bunch of different things. Um, we'll hear about the definition of a flood floodplain and the notion of a 100-year flood event. We'll hear about how floodplains are modeled and the approaches that are used and the activities that are undertaken. We'll hear about hydrologic modeling and an explanation of how all of that works, and we'll talk about how all of that translates into the floodplain mapping, the floodplain lines, including recommendations or overviews of the recommendations for different areas. Oh, and we'll also hear about the legislative context, some of the relevant NPCA policies, and again, what the floodplain lines mean for people and their property. Following the presentation, there will be an opportunity to share questions of fact or clarification. And then after the Q&A and the discussion, we'll talk about next steps and other opportunities to stay engaged, to share additional questions, to share comments and so forth. And by the way, the NPCA invites you to visit the project website to review the draft report for this initiative and also the associated maps. I'll read that website out to you now. I'll forewarn you, it is a long address, um, so you might want to have a pen and paper handy. We will also be putting it on screen a little bit later, so don't be alarmed if you don't get it all now, but I will reference it. Um, so that you are aware of it at the outset of the meeting. So here it goes, HTTPS full colon, and then a forward slash, another forward slash, then getinvolved.npca.ca forward slash Grimsby hyphen Lincoln hyphen floodplain hyphen mapping. So again, one more time, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash get involved dot NCPA dot or sorry dot NPCA dot CA 
forward slash Grimsby hyphen Lincoln hyphen floodplain hyphen mapping. Or another thing you can do is just contact um, the NPCA project manager, and his name is Steve Miller. I'll more formally introduce him to you later. He can be reached at smiller at npca.ca. So to be respectful of your time, we're looking to wrap the meeting up in its entirety by no later than eight o'clock. We may not even go that long. We'll see how many questions there are and so forth. But just again, to be clear, Tonight's meeting is focused on the Grimsby Creeks floodplain mapping initiative. This meeting is not about any or everything that may bug you about the NPCA or living in the region. Those issues can best be addressed outside of the meeting through other means and in other forms. Um, having said that, the NPCA uh, is very much looking forward to the open sharing of information and again a good constructive dialogue and they appreciate value adding questions um, that can help result in the best initiative outcome um, as i said at the end of the presentation segment we'll be inviting questions of factor clarification on our topic and the npca team will address as many questions as there is time for in the session We'll also outline the range of opportunities outside of the session that are available to you for providing, again, any additional questions or comments you might have. Um, I'll also note that some people sent questions in advance of the meeting, and our speakers will try to address them either during the presentation or toward the latter part of the meeting when we get into the Q&A part of the agenda. Um, please note, though, that the team is not addressing individual property or site-specific items today. These can be addressed post-session to the NPCA project manager. And again, I'll, I'll more formally introduce them in just a couple of minutes. Before I go on and before we go on, though, I need to talk a little bit about the nature of this WebEx session. And some of you are, you know, veterans, you've used WebEx many times. For others, this might be their first time that they're doing so. So a couple of things. First of all, the session is being recorded. And this is being done for a few reasons. First, the NPCA will have something to which they can refer when they're putting together their event summary. But more importantly, the recording will be placed on the project website for others to view who may not um, have been able to attend or participate this evening. Now, for those of you who have not used WebEx or may not be that familiar with it, I'll briefly describe the functionality of this webinar. As an attendee in the webinar, you cannot, I repeat, you cannot be seen or be heard by us or by anyone else participating. We invite you to send your questions throughout the session by using the question and answer function, that is the Q&A function, which is typically found on the panel at the right side of the bottom of your device. If you haven't already opened the Q&A function, you might want to do so now. And again, you can do so by clicking on the three dots icon, again, typically found at the bottom right of your screen. The Q&A function should pop up. And within the Q&A function, please ensure that you select the NPCA chat moderator. This is really important. So again, once you've got your Q&A open, make sure that you're directing questions to the NPCA chat moderator. Um, questions sent this way will only be seen by the moderator and then they will be forwarded to me and I'll be putting them to our panel of responders a little bit later in the meeting. So again, that is your way to engage with us in this information session. It's by using the Q&A function and by addressing those questions to the NPCA chat moderator. If you have any technical issues, um, please email them to, and I'll read this out slowly, Sebastian, so that's spelled S-E-B, 
A S T I E N at skycomp. That's S K Y C O M P dot C A. So again, that's Sebastian at skycomp dot C A. And Sebastian will do his best to assist you. For those of you who have chosen to dial into the meeting, in other words, you are using just a simple phone and not a computer or web enabled device, you'll be able to listen to the presentation, but obviously you won't be able to see it and you won't be able to share any questions. Um, if you happen to be following um, what's happening with a paper copy that you may have received in advance, our presenters will occasionally reference page numbers or slide titles to help you uh, follow along. So again, if you have any questions about anything you're hearing in the presentation, or perhaps that's not in the presentation, but that is related to our thematic topic area, please forward them through the Q&A function. And this is important as they occur to you. Don't hold them up until the end of the presentation. As they occur to you, send them along again to the NPCA chat moderator. Um, and by the way, if due to time constraints, your question is not addressed this evening, be assured that it will be considered in the NPCA staff documentation of questions and comments that are received as part of the initiative. So let me introduce a few people. Um, first of all, I understand that we have some of our esteemed elected officials and NPCA board members joining us. Um, and first of all, I just want to say it's great to have you in the virtual house and thank you for your interest in the topic. Um, let me take a moment to introduce the team that you will be hearing from today, either as presenters of information or again as potential responders to your questions. And I'll ask them if they would be so kind as to just turn their video on and give you a quick wave as I introduce each one. Um, the first individual is not on video, but I will just um, make mention that we have with us this evening Darren McKenzie, who is the Director of Watershed Management. Um, and again, Darren is not on camera at the moment. We have Steve Miller, who I mentioned earlier is the NPCA's Project Manager for the initiative. He's also a Senior Manager of Water Resources with uh, the NPCA. And we have David DeLuce, who's a Senior Manager Planning and Regulations uh, with NPCA. And from a firm called Aquafor Beach that is assisting the NPCA with this initiative, we have Dave Maunder, who is a principal with the firm, and he's also the consulting team project manager. And of course, we have all of you, the members of the public, without whom this meeting wouldn't make much sense. So in the interests of time, let's move to our next agenda item. And as mentioned, we're gonna begin with an overview presentation. And Dave Bonder, again, the consultant team project manager from Aquafor Beach, is gonna take us through the first chunk of the material. Then Steve Miller and David DeLuce from the NPCA will share some information as well. And another sort of last reminder, as questions occur to you at any time during the presentation, you know, don't wait until the end. Please share them through the Q&A function. That would be greatly appreciated. And it's really nice to have you all joining us tonight. And thank you again for your interest in the topic. Um, Dave, over to you to start us off with the presentation. Yeah, trying to give Sebastian a call. Um, Glenn, I'm not sure. Can people see the screen? Uh, I can see the screen and I can hear you. Okay, sorry, just a little bit different than last night. So uh, thank you for the introduction, Glenn. It's going to take about 15, 20 minutes to go through the process. So just uh, with respect to the title, it's called a floodplain mapping update. The reason it's called an update is there was floodplain mapping done approximately 30 years ago. And Steve will comment on the uh, frequency of floodplain mapping after I give my presentation. 
So what is a floodplain? A floodplain is a, the river's floodplain represents the estimated extents of water coverage during a specified or specific flood event. So within NPCA, these, uh, these regulations and the lines vary from across the province, but within the NPCA jurisdiction, the 100-year flood is used as a standard event to define a river's floodplain. And a 100-year event, in theory, has an opportunity or a chance to occur once every, uh, once every year. So just a little bit of a grammat or a graphic on what a floodplain is. So if you take a vertical cross section through the earth, you can see here that we have the, the channel. And typically if it's not raining, there's just a very small amount of water in it. And what they have off to the side is what's typically referred to as the potential floodplain areas. What we try and do is you'll, uh, Glenn mentioned before, we have a hydrologic model. And basically what that does is when it rains, the hydrologic model makes a prediction of how much water will get to a given point in the stream. And as you can see on here, we have surface runoff and we have infiltration. And typically as you urbanize an area, as, as Grimsby grows, you'll get uh, more runoff from a given area because of, of items such as paving over parking lots and stuff like that. Um, within the stream itself, we have the river, and we also have a series of crossings. The bridges and culverts are represented in the model, and I'll get into that in a little more detail in a minute. And typically what happens is that the bridges or the culverts become the limiting factor as flows go into the stream and try and um, make it their way through the crossing. So if you add all that up, what you get is you have a floodplain, and at each cross section in the model, You'll see in a moment uh, we make predictions as to the water surface elevation and the water surface elevation is then used to dictate whether you're inside the floodplain or outside of the floodplain. Um, so we have a series of streams that we're looking at. Um, Steve will mention this a bit later, but the streams are generally named based on their uh, proximity to the outlet from the Niagara River to Lake Ontario. So from left to right we have um, tributaries 44A and 44, uh, tributary 39, together with uh, tributary 32, 31, and 29 on the right side of the screen. So what we did basically is there's a number of um, things we do is we try and go into the field and collect as much data as we can to act to accurately characterize the amount of water that would be coming from a given drainage area and also the, the water elevation or the surface elevation in the streams. So we did a lot of field work and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, just what we what we picked up in the field to try and make our our findings as accurate as possible. We also mentioned um, we run hydrologic and hydraulic models to define flows at key points and to determine the floodplain extents. So as you can imagine, there will be less flows in the headwaters of a stream than there will be at the outlet just because the area increases significantly as you move downstream. And then what we'd like to do is figure out if there's roadways or structures or buildings that are identified and are susceptible during the 100-year flood event. Um, with roadways, we're concerned because of the frequency of uh, overtopping of, a, of a, a roadway and, you know, passage during extreme rainfall events for emergency vehicles or just for general cars. Um, we then make recommendations how to mitigate the impacts of flood hazards. And lastly, we put an associated preliminary cost. Um, these are high-level estimates we're doing today. A lot of the information we will provide will be subsequently refined in more detailed studies. Uh, for example, if a road's replaced, we may give um, the approximate size of a culvert if that road is replaced, but there'd be further work required to better define the actual extent and size of the culvert. So I mentioned before, what you see here is a typical shot of a stream and um, at the downstream end of a bridge. So we went into the field and we collect as much data as we could. Um, and then what we do, as I mentioned before, we develop a hydrologic model, which defines the flows, followed by a hydraulic model, which defines the water surface elevation. And ultimately, we prepare, you'll see at the end, a series of floodplain maps, and those maps will help define whether we are in or outside of a floodplain for any given location along the stream. The last thing we do is we identified flood hazard areas, and then we looked at mitigation measures and cost estimates for that. So I mentioned, I'll just show you over here. What we did is all roadway crossings, 
Our roadway crossings for the water courses were surveyed. There was 42 in total. So we're looking at the structure type, the material, the opening shape and dimensions. We need to get the upstream and downstream inverts. And um, basically what we've done, for example, here. So you see the roadway, if you can see my mouse, is on top. We have a culvert here. And as you can see, we measure the opening, the width, the height. We measure the invert elevation at both the upstream and downstream side. All this material, all this information is needed so we can accurately uh, try and represent the floodplains. So I mentioned the hydrologic model. I won't try and get too particular, but you need a hydrologic model. It's a computer model we use, and it will estimate the 100-year design flows at key locations. And we do this both for existing conditions and future conditions. Um, the flows that we have there today may change. Generally, they may increase if there's future urbanization in a watershed. So we need to know what's there now and what's there in the future. And as you'll see in a moment, the future condition is basically um, defined by what's called an official plan. So we again, we do it for existing and future conditions. Um, and for Grimsby, uh, the official plan was to the year 2031, so it's only about uh, 11 years away, but it does provide what the, the town feels uh, ultimate development will be in 11 years from now. So as I mentioned before, if you look at this, this is the official plan, and I won't get into it in great detail, but what it's showing is really most of the yellow areas are what are referred to as the urban settlement areas, and what we have in sort of orange dotted areas are major intensification areas. So that's what Grimsby has from a larger scale perspective. And then we can break it down and actually define different land uses, um, whether it's industrial, commercial, or residential. And again, the importance of this is typically an industrial area will generate more flow per, per unit area per hectare than a residential area is. Uh, again, just because of the amount of perv or impervious surfaces you have in an area like that. As you can see on here, this is just one map. So over here on the right, this is tributary 29. So what I want to just show you is all the blue dots are where we've estimated flows. You can't estimate flows at every point along there. It would take forever. And what you see in the brown, if I can just move my mouse, is the brown is what's called a catchment area or a subwatershed area. So everything within that brown area drains to that blue node and then we add up all the flows as we work our way downstream. So again, at the upstream end, you're going to have lower flows because we don't have much of a drainage area. And when we get to the mouth, where you see the mouth is called J1676, that's where you would have your highest flows. So um, we presented one table and what I was just going to walk through this slowly is we have each of the watersheds. And I mentioned before it was an update study. So there was work done here in 1989. And what we show on here, we represent flows in what's called cubic meters per second. Um, so CMS, as you see at the top. So what you're seeing, I'll just use one for an example. Um, use um, Lake Ontario tributary 29. So back in 1989, the flow rate at the mouth of the the tributary was estimated to be 10.6 cubic meters a second. So again, the higher that number is, the more cross-sectional area you would need for the channel or the, the structure to convey the flows. Um, in 1989, they also looked at a future development flow, and that 1989 future flow was probably similar to what we have in a way of representation of developed lands, and they found a flow to be about 12.1. You can see that our study um, has come up with a number that's quite similar. And again, these numbers probably, if they're within 20 or 30 percent of each other, that's about how accurate you would expect them to be. And we're showing the, the future flow for 2031 to be the same because there's no further development within Lake Ontario Tributary 29, or if there is, it has nominal impact. So again, what you've got then, we have Within each of these six tributaries, we have a series of different flow rates at different locations along the tributary. And what we're showing here is kind of a summary of the flows at the mouth of each of the tributaries. So as I mentioned before, uh, a hydraulic model, the HECRAS model is used universally throughout um, North America. We took the data that I showed you in the field. So what we did is we measured all the structures. We looked at the channels. We looked at the type of vegetation as this impacts how much water can be conveyed from point A to point, v, point B. 
And what we did is we come up with a model. And I wanted to explain to you a little bit what the heck RAS model is and how we calculate flows. So what we're doing is we're literally taking a vertical cross section through the ground. So what we're trying to do is from one end to the other, we're trying to get the ground elevation as we move. And then as we get into the stream system, you can see over here. So what you see here are the ground elevations represented. And then you obviously have the stream system and a cross section. What you're seeing in blue here is this is called the extent of the floodplain. So we actually define the floodplain at regular intervals and then we interpolate between. So anything you see in blue there is deemed to be within the floodplain. Anything outside of that is deemed to be outside of the floodplain. And Dave Duluth will talk later about what you can and cannot do inside or outside of a floodplain. And basically we're doing this for two reasons. Um, one reason is to identify any buildings or structures that would be in the floodplain, but also if future development occurs, the Conservation Authority and the municipality now have an understanding of where development could or could not take place. So we de developed a series of floodplain mapping for each of um, Grimsby and Lincoln, which we did last night. Just wanted to show you here. So this is just, this is one of the representative ones. So what you see in blue is the water course. So you have a road going across. You have the QEW down here. What you see in yellow is what's called the floodplain. And in this case, we're flowing from the bottom to the top. And if you see a very wide line like you see um, in and around here, that typically tells you that the structure is undersized. And basically what's happening as the rain increases and the flows increase, the water spreads out wider and wider before it can get through the culvert that's underneath that road. If you see a very narrow um, projection upstream of a, of a road, then chances are the culverts of adequate size. So I mentioned before, what we did is we identified floods hazard areas after we completed the floodplain mapping. And a flood hazard area, as noted, is a building within the floodplain or a structure, a culvert or bridge, uh, which is overtopped during the 100-year storm. We looked at alternative flood relief options um, at each of these alternatives. So the options included the following five here. So what you'll see where possible, we're trying to identify where the municipality or the conservation authority could construct something in order to bring the flood line in and therefore take these buildings or structures outside of the floodplain. So that could be done through just upgrading a culvert capacity. So in other words, if the culvert's one meter by two meters now, maybe you can make it one meters by four meters wide and it should theoretically let twice as much flow through and reduce the width of the floodplain there. Um, we can also put dikes or berms in and these can be done either on within public lands or on private property. Sometimes you'll see a couple of the examples here where the water course just isn't, the actual culverts are fine, but the water courses themselves are just too small, too narrow. So what we can do is try and expand or widen out. Typically, occasionally you can deepen the water course. So that allows more water to get into it. I mentioned at the top, there's a couple of sites. There's two sites in Grimsby here where we do not feel that there's anything that the public can do to take a couple of, um, um, properties outside of the floodplain. So in this case, uh, structural flood proofing would have to be done by the homeowners. That can be sort of, you know, barricading off low openings and windows and stuff like that, or indeed try to regrade your property to ensure that uh, water doesn't get in, in, in through the lower openings in your, in your house. So Grimsby isn't too bad. Um, some of these studies we've done, we've identified as much as 50 or 100 flood hazard areas. We've only identified seven. And of the seven, we found that there was remediation works that the public could do in two locations, two locations, sorry. And this would address five of the flood hazard areas we have. So the other two, um, by process of elimination, would need uh, private property works done to alleviate the problem. So again, in Grimsby, the issues are, again, as compared to some other areas, are relatively minor. Um, so th this is, um, sorry about that, this is Central Avenue in Tributary 31. And what we have here, again, so the flows are going from the bottom of the page up. There's a culvert here 
and an open stream here. And what's happening is the culvert's too small. In this case, it's not possible to upgrade the culvert. So what we're talking about doing here. So you see, sorry, on the left, we have the flood hazard area. So this is area LO31-1. There's a private building, a home in the floodplain. And what we're suggesting here is that a small berm could be built to the left. So a berm could be built and the water course could be reconstructed here in this manner to build it up to an elevation of about 92 meters. And what that would do is this yellow line would then come in to the left of that building and therefore taking that home outside of, of the floodplain. Um, we've shown on the right-hand side um, an estimated cost of $50,000 to construct this berm. So the other four locations um, that we um, have can be dealt with, and this is Kelson Avenue North here. So what we really have here, again, if you look on the left, you'll see four issues. So Kelson Avenue North itself floods, and then you can see over to here, there's a series of properties in and around here, so where you see the red, and then south of the QEW, we also have a large building and another property here. And really what it is here, when you look at this, if you can see it, I mean, basically you have a few meters from the small water course to the adjacent um, to the adjacent property. So what we're talking about here is channel works to be undertaken. And those channel works would therefore, if we widened the channel from this point, they would solve a number of properties, um, a number of problems, sorry. So the private buildings you see there um, would um, be reduced with respect to flooding. Kelson Avenue North crossing um, the road would be taken out of the floodplain. And then if we go down to the bottom here, widening this would allow these properties here to be taken out of the floodplain. The floodplain here is so wide, it's actually off the street. So a series of channel works would, would alleviate all four of those items we show there, including overtopping of the road and the three buildings in proximity to the floodplain. So as I mentioned before, there's not many issues in Grimsby. Um, there are two other locations where we see individual properties. And I mean, you know, saying a picture is worth a thousand words, literally, this is the stream and the buildings directly adjacent to it. So there's nothing that could be done to basically widen or expand the stream due to its proximity to that building. So the building itself would have to look at structural measures to try and reduce flooding um, for, for si significant events that occur. And then the last one I have, again, it's just a small building again. When you see a building that's five or 10 meters from a tributary, anytime you're gonna get a significant event, there's a likelihood that that building will um, suffer some flood damage. So that's all I have, Glenn, I'll turn it back to you. Dave, thanks uh, very much for starting us off. So I'm going to hand things to Steve Miller, again, the project manager from NPCA. And just while he's loading his presentation, I'll note again as a reminder, if you have any questions, don't save them until the end. Please shoot them along through the Q&A function to the NPCA chat monitor moderator rather and i know that did i say moderator moderator um i'm a little tongue-tied tonight anyway again if you have any questions please send them through the q a to the npca chat moderator and i know we've had some folks join us in progress thank you for doing so my name's glenn i'm serving as the facilitator for tonight's session steve over to you please thanks glenn um, can can you, everybody hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, Steve. Okay, and can you see the screen? I can. Great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Steve Miller. I'm the Senior Manager of Water Resources with the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about what has changed between the floodplain mapping that was done in 1989 and the updated floodplain mapping uh, study that uh, Dave Monder and his team at Aquifer Beach has undertaken. So, as David mentioned, the floodplain was last mapped in 89. 
Um, let's, if we remember back to 89, a few things jump out. Uh, the first is a sweet Camaro um, on the up right hand side and not so sweet personal computer. Uh, Rain Man won Best Picture that year. The top song was Phil Collins, um, Another Day in Paradise, and of course, The Berlin Wall Fell. So let's take a look at, at the water courses themselves. Now, a couple of things. Each water course has two names. Here we're looking at Lake Ontario, tributary number 29. But it also has another name. Its name is Town of Grimsby Outlet number 30. Now, let me explain that. The Conservation Authority, we start naming our water courses way over by the Niagara River. And so we go from east and work our way west. We find we have One Mile Creek and Twelve Mile Creek, but for the small little tributaries that don't have a name, we assign them numbers. Lake Ontario 29, for example. And as we proceed west, we'll see 31 and 39 and so on. Grimsby, on the other hand, had taken a different, um, different approach. They start on the west side of the municipality and number from west to east. So town of Grimsby, outlet number one, also has uh, another name that's Lake Ontario Tributary 44A. So we've, in order to avoid confusion, we've included both names. So what are we looking at here? Well, we see a lot of colors. Let's, let's talk about those colors for a second. The purple line is the updated floodplain, mapping that Aquifer Beach has done. The blue area is the existing 1989 floodplain. The green area are those areas that are no longer within the floodplain as calculated by Aquifer Beach. And so in the 89 study they were, but now we're showing that they are no longer lands within the floodplain. The red area, on the other hand, those are lands that are now included in the floodplain. Okay, we also see a couple of words on the screen here. Let me, let me jump into the, the highlighter here. Bear with me. There we go. And so we've got these spill areas. Just what is a spill area? Well, a classic floodplain, you can think of it as an eaves trough or roof gutter. You pour water into it and all that water is contained within that eaves trough. It flows down gradient. That's a classic confined floodplain. A spill area, on the other hand, you can think of as a snooker table. Tilt it up, pour some water on it, and that water runs across that snooker table in a broad, shallow manner. Now let's go back to that eaves trough. You've filled it with water. You stick a brick in it now, and that brick serves to back up all that water in the floodplain. Well, let's go to our snooker table. We poured water on it, put a brick right in the middle of the snooker table, and that, that water, that shallow, broad of water as it flows down the snooker table simply flows around the brick. So those are spill areas. There's a difference in policy, conservation authority policy, as to what you can and can't do in a floodplain and what you can and can't do in a spill area. In a floodplain, much like in the eaves trough, if you build a house in that floodplain, it's going to take some damage. It's going to back water up because it's a confined system. On the other hand, a spill area, you know, building something is allowed in a spill area as long as you floodproof it because the water will flow over and around. So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So with all that in mind, let's take a look at Lake Ontario 29. What's changed? Well, there's been a number of developments over the years. There's been a bunch of storm sewers. Storm sewers introduce water into this little park here just to the east of Tomahawk Drive, where once the water flowed over land towards the QEW, it now spills, spills over onto Tomahawk, okay? Um, water comes in via storm sewer, flows through this, this little ditch, hits a storm sewer, and goes on its merry way to South Service Road. When the capacity of that storm sewer is exceeded, 
it spills spills out this way spills out this way okay so this area these houses are no longer within a confined floodplain moving downstream past the tracks around south service road we see the floodplain hangs out in the ditches between the south service road qew south service road and the train tracks once again it enters a storm sewer goes on its merry way briefly we see it it's a little creek here then dives back into a storm sewer and flows north towards the lake these areas that were once impacted because of the development that had gone on now are not okay so what we have here is a better definition a better understanding as to what's really happening here with the development with the uh, storm sewers directing flow away from water courses um, we had better understand these spill areas and what's actually happening okay let's move on lake ontario 31 also known as grimsby at 25. dave talked about this one um so where are we in the world deer park villa we see the hospice right here again we have a number of storm sewers that send water right around deer park villa and so here's a here's a blow up here we see the water as it flows north heads this way it backs up it ponds in the side yard of deer park villa the hospice thankfully is high and dry you got center street here just like dave mentioned the water backs up backs up and then spills out onto center street goes either way storm sewer again this way south service road roadside ditches back under the qew and here this is another case all in through here as to why we update so baker road wastewater treatment plant right here okay the town has had work done to realign rechannel the uh, water course include some stormwater quality ponds in this area all in an effort to make way for some of the crescent subdivision so where floodplain existed here because of work done in the past now there's no longer floodplain so we see it's contained within the channel hits lake street it no longer overtops lake street because lake street has been reconstructed goes under the culvert and of course folks living north of lake street know there's a a um, steep ravine that the floodplain is contained in. So this is an instance where we're updating what has happened on the ground. It better represents what is really un been undertaken in the last couple of years. Okay, Lake Ontario 32, Grimsby Outlet 22. Um, for context, this is the one that flows through Queensland Cemetery. So starting, let's start upstream of the Queen Elizabeth Way. So before, when the floodplain was mapped, we see the green line. We see that the floodplain flowed over Margaret Ave, um, kind of on its way. A lot of these properties in through here were impacted. With our, this was 30 years ago. Let's fast forward 30 years. We have better, more accurate mapping, uh, more powerful computers, a better understanding, uh, more powerful techniques. We are able to better understand what's actually happening. And so these, where the water courses do exist, we see that there is floodplain, but these culverts are no longer, or sorry, they have the capacity to pass the flood flows. We've uh, calculated that they are no longer overtopped. And really, other than the um, case of the roads here, you can see the flood lines are, are pretty, pretty similar to what they were back in 1989 at least up uh, downstream of the QEW. Upstream, we've got the railway tracks, and railway tracks are no notorious for being bottlenecks. And we see that's what's happening. We see the flow coming. It's backing up. It can't get all through the, the culvert under the railway. backs up. But thankfully, most of it is in Queensland Cemetery. And these houses on the west, they the backyards might be, might be flooded, but the stru structures themselves aren't. Go upstream a little bit. In the past, uh, the floodplain mapping only stopped uh, partway into Centennial Park. 
we extended it to see what's going to happen and and we see you know all this red this is new floodplain mapping simply because it didn't exist anymore but all that flood these floodwaters are contained within centennial park and heading west lake ontario uh, 39 grimsby outlet 9 to give you an idea where we are this is the uh information gateway this is where i stopped for tim horton's coffee on the way back from toronto um this tributary was never floodplain mapped and so all this stuff is brand new that's why you see so much red and so it starts hunter road the floodplain starts and it skirts it structures aren't impacted here it skirts past the subdivision right right here most of the floodplain is contained within the woodlot past the cn rail and then into a storm sewer this is the car dealership we got three car dealerships in through here we got a big storm pipe that conveys all this the flow in this water course past it to south service road and then we see how the floodplain is is confined within the channel as it makes its way out to the lake all right our good friends lake ontario 44 and lake ontario 44a lots going on here so let's talk about it we're going to start the very upstream end first in the 1989 study we can see the extent of the the floodplain so let's look at lake ontario 44a this floodplain hit the railway tracks and for 44 all this area was was determined to be floodplain a confined floodplain which has its its own ramifications its own prohibition under policy well with this updated floodplain mapping study we've been better able to understand what's happening we have a spill area upstream of the tracks okay remember that snooker table and the brick kind of thing so what this means is there is now no longer a prohibition under policy um, for doing works doing projects in this area upstream of the tracks so we head downstream under the railway tracks making our way towards South Service Road. And again, we do see the undersized, the very, um, these watercourses, 44 and 44A, they're very shallow. And when you put a lot, of, a lot of flow through them, it doesn't take much for them to overtop their banks. And they spill all over the place. The spill's going all over, and it's really the same. Um, once it hits South Service Road, 44, spill's going this way, this way, exactly the same. Undefined, shallow, broad, again where once was identified just upstream of south, Sur south service road that this was a confined floodplain now we better understand the mechanism and these these owners of these businesses and this industry um, now have the ability to do more things because we understand now they're in a spill zone so let's take a look at that next slide let's go let's go downstream the queen elizabeth way so we're between the qew and winston road Let's take a look uh, on the right-hand side, Lake Ontario 44. Again, water flows north, hits Winston Road, backs up, and uh, we see Sumner Court. There's some um, uh, backyards getting wet. Not that much. The structures are protected, but all that flow starts spilling, spilling to the east uh, towards uh, Winston Road. And then once it gets past Winston Road, we of course have the uh, the lagoons here, bird watching, that kind of thing. The uh, army firing range in through here, not a lot going on, so it doesn't matter that the floodplain's broad. Let's take a look at Lake Ontario 44A. So we've got the flows coming under the QEW, and as David mentioned, um, this area had never been afforded floodplain mapping. It was never floodplain mapped before, so we didn't have an understanding as to what was actually happening. So we see there's some structures in through here that are potentially impacted but as the water flows up it starts spilling um, both east and west down winston road as it makes its way north to the lake so that's a general overview a high level overview of what we had found and what the differences are if you want to take a look at your own individual property i'd encourage you to go to our website we see the uh, the web address that Glenn had mentioned right down at the bottom here. Uh, type that in, 
This guy right here is my home in the floodplain. Click on it. It'll take you to a Google Maps type uh, type search. You can navigate around just like you do Google Maps, and you can zoom on in, see if your house is in the floodplain or if it's not. And if you have any questions about that, how to get to, how to get to the website, how to find your house, what does that mean? Um, there's my contact information right here. Feel free to give me a call. Uh, my phone number, email me, whatever. Be happy to uh, chat with you about this project, answer any questions you might have, and uh, answer any uh, uh, concerns, try to address any concerns that you might have. So that's my presentation. I thank you very much for listening. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Dave Deleuze. Again, just a reminder, everybody, as David's pulling his presentation up, if you have any questions, don't hold them until the end. Please use the Q&A function to send them along to the NPCA chat moderator. And this is the last component of the presentation, and then we'll be getting to your questions right after that. Thank you, David. Go ahead. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Steve. And um, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to attend tonight. So. I'm just going to go through a quick policy to explain what are the implications if you have floodplain mapping on your property. So people might think that, oh, okay, I've got floodplain. Does that mean I can't do anything? Well, not exactly. So we'll we'll talk about that. So for some background, first thing, high level conservation authorities get their ability to regulate people's properties uh, for floodplains as well as other natural hazards through the Conservation Authorities Act and specifically section 28. And furthermore, under that section, it gives the authorities or conservation authorities the ability to make regulations that would um, control development and dictate where um, development can or cannot happen with respect to a natural hazard. So the specific references are subsection 2.1 of the regulation. So that's where development is prohibited. And then further under section or subsection 3.1, uh, that talks about permission to develop. So that is commonly referred to as a conservation authority permit. Now, the other area where we do get some uh, legislative authority for um, commenting on floodplains is through the Planning Act and specifically Section 3, which deals with provincial policy statements. So many people have, may have heard of uh, the provincial policy statement or the PPS as it's known for short. And conservation authorities through an MOU or a memorandum of understanding with the provincial government are responsible for commenting on section 3.1, which deals with natural hazards. And that is on behalf of the province. So anytime there's a planning act application, so that's a zoning bylaw amendment, a subdivision application, minor variance or consent, uh, the conservation authority is responsible for commenting on section 3.1 of the uh, provincial policy statement. Now, we have our own set of policies that help guide our decision making when we're rev uh, reviewing applications. We don't just make things up out of thin air. So we have a policy document that was first approved in uh, two, September 2018. It was a uh, major update from our previous version, so it's relatively new. That document underwent uh, extensive public and stakeholder consultation. Uh, it initially had begun in 2015 and there were um, multiple open houses and other events that uh, allowed the, um, the public to provide comments and feedback on the, uh, the document. So the document provides context for why we regulate floodplains. So first and foremost, it's to implement our mandate, which is to protect people and property from hazards such as floodplains. And the policy document also, one of the new highlights for that document was talking about the requirements for establishing what's called a two zone floodplain. Now, this is a little more relevant to uh, rural or um, municipalities that don't have a lot of urban areas. But um, again, we put a, a base framework in there that we could establish a two zone floodplain. So in a two zone, you would have what's known as a flood fringe in which certain activities are a little more, um, were a little more permissive towards things. And then you would have the main flood way, which is essentially your 100 year floodplain and it would be more restrictive. And as I mentioned earlier, the policies that we use guide our decision making when we're reviewing planning act approvals or when we're looking at our own permit applications. 
Now, again, I mentioned uh, people might think, okay, I've got floodplain on my property. So now what, what can I do? Does that mean my property is sterilized? So the answer to that is no. Um, there are some things that can be done on a property that has a uh, floodplain on it. So these are just generally um, uh, general uh, things that can be done. They are all subject to conservation authority approval and they're subject to the more specific policies within our document. So it would depend on scope, nature and location of what's being proposed. But for example, passive open space uses. So trails, um, open space parks, those kind of things could be considered. Accessory structures, uh, so a shed, those type of things, things that would have, um, uh, wouldn't be subject to major or significant uh, costs or damage if uh, there is ever flooding. Additions to existing buildings up to 46.5 square meters, which is approximately 500 square feet. So again, if you have a house that's existing within the floodplain, uh, we can entertain additions to that house uh, subject to certain criteria and likely that uh, depending on the flood depth uh, would be subject to some form of flood proofing. 50 cubic meters of clean fill. So one of the big things we're concerned about when anything is being placed in a floodplain is especially if it's just fill is we want to see what's going to be the impact of that fill placement on surrounding properties. So the water that is normally occupied in the floodplain gets displaced by placement of that fill. So the more fill you add, the more concern we get of making sure that there's no negative impact to any other properties. In other words, making sure that other properties that may have been outside of the floodplain won't be pulled into the floodplain by placing of that fill. And generally and tied to this is our policies have a little more flexibility around cut and fill. And it's more on the technical side and maybe to back up what a cut and fill is, is just as I was talking about where you can place fill in the floodplain, but it would cause water to be displaced elsewhere, is you can compensate for that by removing uh, areas of uh, land that are not in the floodplain. So taking uh, away stuff, that's where you would be making a cut and placing that fill elsewhere in the floodplain. And what you could essentially do through this process is you can actually reconfigure the shape of the floodplain. Now that's not an option that's available for every property. It depends on the nature of the floodplain, its shape, the depth, and how much land you have available on the property to kind of do this balanced cut and fill approach. But uh, our policy document provided more clarity around the technical requirements for that. And then we have a, um, finally, what's called like a, a catch-all provision. So if there was something that wasn't listed specifically in our policy about what's approved, but we look at it and it's something that maybe didn't fit the description, but in reviewing it, it won't have any uh, significant impacts or any impacts on surrounding properties. It wouldn't be subject to any major damage or any uh, significant property costs should there be flooding. It's basically a catch-all to allow us to support those type of proposals. But again, there's um, scrutiny involved in that, possibly the uh, need to provide a hydraulic study to demonstrate that there wouldn't be any impact on the floodplain. Now, what is not allowed? So we have the first three bullets there those all come from the provincial policy statement so the province has told us that in no way are these types of uses allowed so um i'll just quickly touch on them sensitive uses hospitals nursing homes basically institutional type uses emergent services facilities so police stations fire stations uh, facilities of those nature and then uses associated with the disposal, treatment, manufacturing, processing, or storage of hazardous substances. So the main concern there is you don't want to have anything that would be of a polluting nature being subject to flooding during a flood event. And then similarly, how we had a um, catch-all policy for uses that would be permitted. There is a catch-all policy for uses that if we look at it and it wasn't explicitly spelt out in the uh, prohibited or the prohibition section and it just could not be supported because it's going to have a negative impact to the floodplain for um, on additional property or surrounding properties or maybe it's of a significant polluting nature again it allows us to um, essentially refuse that type of permission now when we speak to planning applications, we uh, have to look at things through a slightly different lens. Now conservation authorities, as I mentioned, have 
an MOU with the province where we're commenting on section 3.1 of the provincial policy statement. Now this can lead because the provincial policy statement falls under a different legislation. The definitions in that document are slightly different than the definitions for the same feature in the Conservation Authorities Act. This can lead to, I'll say, uh, kind of wonky situations where you might be able to support a permit application, but not the corresponding planning application that is related to it or vice versa. And again, that's unfortunately because of the, um, the differences between the definitions in those two pieces of legislation. Now, our job at the Conservation Authority is when we um, initially get wind of a proposal under the Planning Act, we uh, sit down with town staff and uh, the consult or the uh, proponent, and we will point out any of these um, possible inconsistencies so that uh, an application can be worked around that to the extent possible to eliminate that conflict. So that way we can make sure that we are still protecting people and uh, property from flooding, but also at the same time, not unduly um, withholding support on an application. So again, we try to make sure that we're balancing uh, those competing interests. And then lastly, uh, lot creation with uh, planning applications is generally not supportable. That is something that uh, we want to discourage for all the reasons we've uh, mentioned uh, tonight that we're essentially trying to make sure we're protecting people and property from flooding and you don't want to uh, essentially establish a new situation where somebody who's buying a new lot wants to put a new home on there is going to be subject to flooding that's not a situation we want to um, to support and that's all I have for my presentation so I'll be happy to take any questions thank you Great. Thank you uh, very much, both to uh, Dave and David and to Steve as well for the very informative presentation. Um, so if you've joined us in progress, you've been listening to NPCA staff and their consultant take us through the overview presentation. I'm Glenn Pache. I'm the independent facilitator for the session. Um, thank you again to everyone for participating and thank you as well for the insightful questions that have already been submitted. They are much appreciated. Let's move to the questions now. Um, as they've been submitted, the NPCA staff have been reviewing them to identify those that perhaps are similar in nature and with a view to addressing any duplication. Um, and in some cases, they've been consolidating multiple questions into a single question where it makes sense again to do so. So please don't worry if the question posed this evening isn't exactly as it was asked by you. And again, there may not be time, may not be time to address all of the questions in this session but NPCA staff will be reviewing them. And as I mentioned earlier, they will be documented as input to the initiative. So let's get to your questions. And Steve, maybe this first one is best put to you. We hear a lot um, these days and rightly so about climate change. And someone is asking, is climate change being considered in the modeling? And if so, how is it considered? Um, in particular, given that we're seeing more frequent and severe weather events of different kinds. So Steve, do you wanna jump in on that one? Do you consider climate change? And if so, how do you do that? Sure, thanks for the question, Glenn. The storm we presently consider is the 100 year storm event. Now, what is that 100 year storm event? You can think of it as a rainfall, a big storm dropping approximately four inches of rain in 12 hours, okay? that's. That's a nasty storm. That's what we look at. Climate change, it is a thing. Now, what do we do about it? And that's really the $64,000 question. And that's one of the things that the Conservation Authority is looking at. We're undertaking a strategic planning process, looking at what the Conservation Authority is going to focus on in the next number of years. Climate change is one of those things, but we don't have any direction yet. Does um, uh, does our, our regulatory storm change? Does that 100-year storm change? Does it get bigger? If so, to what extent? Um, it's not just 
the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority that's wrestling with this this question. It's every municipality in Ontario. It's every conservation authority in Ontario. And just because there's a big degree of unknown, how do you address it? And some um, some uh, jurisdictions like the City of London has chosen a 250 year storm event, but just what does that mean? There are different ramifications for for different storm events. Is it sufficient to say, okay, we recognize we're going to use the 100 year and that is an acceptable level of risk between keeping folks safe and away from a water course or opening up land for development, letting folks get closer to a water course. All this discussion needs to happen and it'll happen um, with full public consultation when, the con when it's time for the Conservation Authority to actually grapple with that question. But it, it's a great question and something that that is front and center on a heck of a lot of people's minds these days. Steve, you mentioned the 100 year storm and Dave Monder mentioned that as well. Someone is wondering when was the last 100 year storm in Grimsby? Do you know when that was, the date? Okay, no, I can't. Uh, I can't recall if there's ever been a hundred-year storm in Grimsby. That nasty storm, that four inches of rain in twelve hours. But that doesn't mean that that kind of storm doesn't crop up. In the last six years, we've seen hundred-year storms smash Burlington, uh, hit Bimbrook in the city of Hamilton down by the airport. Um, the Short Hills area of uh, Thorold and Pelham completely eroded out Sulphur Springs Drive and the city of Welland. West St. Catharines, Richardson Creek, um, a nasty thunder shower just smashed a number of houses. All this in the last six years. So these storms are real. And, you know, just because I can't recall when it hit Grimsby, if it ever has, let's knock on wood that it never does. And maybe I can ask you and or Dave um, to just speak to this point about a one in a hundred year storm. It doesn't mean that it will only happen once every hundred years. Is that correct? Just some some people are seeking some clarification. Uh, Dave, you want to take this one? You're muted, Dave. Yeah, Dave. You Again, I think as we said in the introduction, I mean, these storms, I mean, just to give you an idea of, um, Steve mentioned four inches of rain over a 12 hour period, but typically a hundred year storm. The cell width is probably four to four to eight kilometers and the cell length is probably 10 to 20 kilometers. So it really just tracks over the Southern part of GTA and where it hits and when it hits is totally a variable entity. For example, Steve mentioned before, um, City of Toronto had three 50-year events in three months back in 1986. So it's it's really a general storm that's used as an indicator. There's no um, um, presumption as to when or where it will occur. Thank you. And we were talking earlier, or you were talking earlier in the overview presentation about tributary 32 and i don't know if we can put that back on screen just as a reference for people we'll see if we're able to do that but someone was asking is there a real serious concern about tributary 32 because i guess it's looking alarming or sounding alarming given what they've heard tonight um so can somebody jump in on that one maybe it's dave maybe it's steve who would like to speak to that issue yeah, I'll uh, I'll take that, Glenn. So let me just let me just share my screen again. Great, thank you. Okay, can you see the screen? I can. Yes. Okay, great. So, tributary thirty-two. That's the watercourse that runs through both Queensland Cemetery and Centennial Park. The I think the concern, if I had to, um, is in the area just uh, south of the QEW, most of that stormwater, most of that floodplain is contained within the Queensland Cemetery. None of the houses located to the west are anticipated to be impacted by that. Okay, so so it looks scary, um, but it, it it's really not. 
and again, if you want to drill down to see if your house is impacted, go to our website and hit that little link, is my house impacted, and you can zoom on in. Great, thanks, Steve. Someone else is wondering, and, and again, this might be good for you, Steve, or Dave, whoever wants to tackle it. Somebody has asked, is urbanization the only factor being taken into account when it comes to changes in flow, or will changes in channel shape and size also be taken into account as the streams erode? So would either of you like to tackle that one, please? Yeah, Steve, I'll start. I mean, you know, urbanization is the primary factor. Um, taking a rural piece of property and developing it probably, in a general sense, doubles the amount of flow and the peak flow that'll come down. Channels do erode, they do change over time, but for the most part, we're dealing with fairly stable streams down here. Um, they do erode, but they don't necessarily widen out that much. In the long term, a channel will expand or widen or deepen as a result of urbanization, but that's a longer term process than the direct uh, transfer from, from rural to urban lands. Thank you, Steve. Anything you wanted to add or? No, I think Dave uh, hit the nail on the head, Glenn. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions about tributary 31. Um, and they're getting a little bit site specific, but you know, they're not exactly property specific. So we'll entertain them this evening. Somebody is saying that residents on Trib 31 on Central and Linwood Avenue have experienced property flooding annually. And they're wondering whether there should be wider setbacks and perhaps more extensive berming done there. Your response, um, Steve, are you the right guy for that one? Yeah, let me uh, let me share my screen again, Glenn, if I may. Yeah, thank you. I can see it. Okay, you can see it. Okay, let's let's find a good friend. Thirty one. Okay, so tributary thirty one is the one that flows past Deer Park Villa and the Hospice. Um, we have uh, Central Ave, Linwood. Yeah, if there's flooding concerns, I would um, suggest that that would be something that the residents and the town and the conservation authority can take a look at to see what um, to come up with a uh, an appropriate solution. Um, we'd be uh, most pleased to do that. Now, the very start of that is to generate something just like we've done here to get an idea as to the extent of the flooding during that big hundred year storm event. Um, you know, we'd want to understand uh, when working with the, the town and the residents to to address flooding, just what's the nature of it, what's the magnitude, all that kind of thing. So this uh, study like this is the first step in coming up with a solution for, for flood prone areas. I hope that helps. Yeah, and, and I hear what you're saying about the uh, Conservation Authority being willing to work with individuals and organizations. Um, I'll ask this next question because, again, someone has submitted it and we're trying to be as helpful as possible in terms of sharing information. This one is also related to TRIP 31, and you just touched on the hospital and, and so forth. They're asking what the impact would be on the new hospital and the proposed new hospice um, building. Have you looked at that at all? Is that part of your analysis to date? Yep. What I what I can tell you, Glenn, is in the area of the hospice in Deer Park Villa, the updated flood lines aren't radically different from the old flood lines. And so the old flood lines have been around for 30 plus years. The the designers of the hospice, the planners, they know where these lines are. And if there is a um if there is an uh, an impact to all the plans, the one of the uh, fortunate things um, that we have going for us is there are things that we can do to move that floodplain around, like David um, Deleuze said, cut fills, that kind of stuff. So where development goes in very close to a floodplain, if there is an impact, we quite often work with uh, work closely with the the developer or the municipality to come up with ways to to mitigate that impact. Great, thank you. So I don't know if this next question was written with a bit of frustration, but I'm going to give it a little bit of frustration as I express it. Um, someone has asked, why did it take almost 30 years to conduct this mapping? Um, who's our best person to take that one on? So I, I think there probably is a, a little frustration there on someone's okay. part. 
Well, like I can I can um take a stab at that. A lot of floodplain mapping happened oh in in the eighties, eighty nine. Um, not much happened in the nineties. Remember, we had the um uh, the Mike Harris years, ninety five. Conservation authorities were were gutted. They only started ramping back up in terms of staff levels in in 2000, 2001. Since 2001, the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority has undertaken floodplain mapping projects. We try and do one or two a year. That being said, we have over 130 watercourses in our jurisdiction. So our focus during that time was to provide floodplain mapping to areas that that were never afforded floodplain mapping. The watercourses in Grimsby and Lincoln, they were fortunate. And there was floodplain mapping in place, but uh, probably two thirds of the watercourses within our jurisdiction were without. So we tried to provide them with floodplain mapping. Once we were in a place where we were satisfied that those watercourses that had experienced development pressure or there were folks living in hazardous areas, once we were satisfied that that floodplain mapping was in place, the new stuff, then we went back and we're in a process now of updating all our old floodplain maps. I hope that helps. Thanks, Steve. No, that's helpful. So someone else has said there is a stormwater pond south of highway number eight on the Kelson Road water course. And I don't know if you can picture exactly where that is. They've gone on to ask, is the capacity of this stormwater pond taken into consideration when you are calculating the floodplain? Um, and should it have water in it from time to time? So is one of you familiar enough with that one to jump in? Um, should it have water in it? Is it taken into consideration? Go ahead, Steve. Dave, Dave do you want to chat about um, uh, stormwater ponds and floodplain mapping? Uh, which Dave you're referring to? Oh, sorry, Dave Launder, <laughs> yourself, buddy. Or I can okay. take it, it's fine. Yeah, no, I mean, generally, um, there's, so a lot of the policy for doing floodplain mapping is from the conservation authorities, but also from the Ministry of Natural Resources. And it's assumed during the regulatory event that the stormwater ponds do not function. Um, they may already be full of water or they may breach or whatever. So ponds are generally not taken into consideration when we undertake floodplain mapping. Again, primarily a provincial regulation and method that we follow. Thank you. Um, so Steve, maybe this next one goes to you. There's, a, I guess, a concern and a question about the currency, the accuracy of some of the mapping. So someone has said the land use maps provided do not appear current. There are high density developments, for example, abutting number 39, and the area is shown as agricultural, which it is not. Um, and this should be impacting the flood hazard to these properties, and people are wondering, will they be updated? Will they be corrected? Um, so first of all, do you agree with the, the comment that they aren't up to date, and will they be updated? Okay, I can, I can take this one. Um... Sebastian, can you uh, kindly, I'd like to put up uh, Lake Ontario 31 again, please, if you would. No, okay, bear with me. Okay, can you can you see the slide? I can, yes. <clears throat> okay. Now so, keep in mind, they, they said 39 though, Steve? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, but I, yeah, I want to okay. show this one because it illustrates my Great. point. Thanks. So you. Uh, on these slides, I try to have the colors stand out. Okay, I want to I want to focus on the changes in the floodplain, the reds and the greens. And to do that, I used a base that um, wasn't dark. It didn't have aerial mapping on it. Okay, that base is is a little older. Okay, and but that doesn't mean that we used that base to generate our floodplain mapping. It, this is for display purposes only. And the reason I wanna show you Lake Ontario 31, take a look on the, the slide on the, the picture on the right. You take a look at Deer Park Villa. You see that, that Deer Park Villa, that's the old building. Take a look at the air photo now on the left-hand side. You can see that 
that air photo shows the addition to Deer Park Villa. It shows the um, the new parking area. OK, so. Rest assured that um, if you're looking at the base mapping without air photos, just that that white with the yellow property lines, that is for um, display purposes only. OK, we used the Conservation Authority in Aquifer Beach used the most current um, land use uh, uh, maps, most current air photos to generate the flows um, in order to calculate the floodplain. But uh, no, somebody has a uh, has a good eye for detail. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, it's good that people are looking closely at this information. That's terrific. It shows a lot of passion and interest in the topic. So there's a couple of questions um, that I see, and I'm going to tie them together relating to erosion. And Steve, again, I don't know if you're best, or maybe we'll get uh, David Deleuze back in on this yeah. one. But the two questions are as follows. Um, someone has said, although floodplain mapping is important, what about the extensive erosion occurring on the major tributaries in Grimsby? And they've pointed out, especially 40 Mile Creek. And then someone else is asking, and this is where we'll put the two together, is there anything being done to decrease the erosion on the slopes of various creeks. So again, if either of you want to jump in on on those two questions, um, you know, are you aware of the erosion? How is that considered and factored in? And then second, is anything being done to minimize or decrease the erosion? Okay, um, I might take this one. So great question and. We have a number. We've got a number of issues in our in our valley lands, on our water courses, um, in our hazard lands. This this study is focused on determining the extent of the of the floodplain during that major storm event, that hundred year storm event. Um, unfortunately, what it doesn't do is address things like erosion in Forty Mile Creek. That's a completely separate thing. And that's, you know, not to, to downplay it or minimize it because it is a thing, you know, who knew? <laughs> but that's that's um, being addressed in in different studies, different ways. Okay, not the focus of, of this this uh, study in terms of erosion on water courses. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the um, the things that the Conservation Authority has done is put our money where our mouth is um, instead of telling people or telling municipalities, hey, fix that erosion on your water course. The Conservation Authority has a whole restoration department complete with with funding and grant programs and technical advice and, and folks that love nothing more than to come on out, take a look, walk with landowners. And if they're they do have a water course on their property and if they are experiencing erosion, um, chat with them about how to help with that and put them in touch with um, uh, funding programs that could help with that kind of thing. Did, does that answer the question? Well, thanks, Steve. So I think we are going to get David Deleuze back into the conversation now. We probably got a couple of questions for him. Um, one of them, and again, this isn't referencing a specific area. I think it's maybe more conceptual in nature. I'm not sure. But someone is asking, David, should a private owner of a woodlot bring in bulldozers to clean out a route for any flood water to alleviate flooding in that area? Is that a um, is that a, a mechanism, a, a desirable practice? David, go ahead, please. Sure, thank you. Um, first, something we have to realize is that floodplains are also a natural occurrence. Now, in urban areas, they are usually um, exasperated because of the nature of impervious surfaces. That means you have more water that would normally get to a water course in a, in a slow manner, getting there quicker, which helps um, create more of a flooding uh, situation, makes it happen quicker. But again, the whole concept of a floodplain, um, especially out in a rural area where there's been no development or alteration to the water course, it is a natural occurrence. So typically, where there are floodplains and they do serve a good purpose. They serve to provide nutrients to areas outside of uh, the actual water course itself. They provide um, habitat for uh, small critters and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that um, if lack of better description, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if there's a water course and there's flooding occurring, um, sorry, 
we want to make sure that um, as long as it's not hurting any property or sorry, hurting uh, any people, if it's not causing an issue that way, we wouldn't necessarily want to see, especially if it's in a wooded area. I mean, again, it's um, uh, floodplains do serve a natural benefit. We wouldn't want to see a wooded area clear it out to for the sake of trying to alleviate some flooding, especially if the flooding is not causing any real real damage to anything or of any concern to anything. So, um, you know, something that uh, we'd have to sit down and discuss further if there are other options, if there's a concern about flooding in that immediate area. But uh, for the sake of uh, removing a woodlot, I, again, that's not necessarily a, a means to justify um, fixing a flooding problem. So let me put this next question to you as well, David, and some of our attendees are obviously very knowledgeable. They're aware of work being done um, by Niagara region and someone has asked, how is the NPCA floodplain mapping feeding into the region's natural heritage system mapping for, they've said the MCR, which I take to be the municipal comprehensive review, um, that they're currently determining which model they will adopt and whether they will have maps for the urban area NHS, the natural heritage system. So how does this work connect at all to that work being done by Niagara region? Yep, that's a very good question. And again, uh, the Conservation Authority is sitting at the table with the region in that process. We are part of their steering committee and their technical advisory committee on the um, official plan update, specifically as it relates to the Natural Heritage Project. So ultimately, this floodplain mapping, and I'll caveat that once approved by our board of directors, uh, that would be used um, by the Conservation Authority to help inform the region's mapping exercise. So we would be looking to the region to identify the boundaries of the new floodplain mapping. And there's way, different ways they can do that. Um, typically in an official plan, you have what's called a land use designation. And um, sometimes you may hear the term overlay. That's another way of identifying um, different land use boundaries. So as long as the floodplain mapping is identified in one of those uh, means and indicated that it's either a floodplain or it's some form of hazard, or again, there can even be, if they want to include it in the actual natural heritage uh, designation itself, there's many different ways that they can still achieve the main objective, which is to make sure that we're not allowing for uh, new development in the floodplains, especially where it could have uh, major impacts to people and property. Thanks, David. Um, let's get uh, the other Dave back in and maybe Steve as well. This is a question similar to what we heard last night about Lincoln, but somebody is wondering if the culverts in Grimsby are undersized, and if so, would it be possible to increase the size of the culverts and by doing so, hopefully help prevent spillage and minimize the size of the floodplain? Um, Dave or Steve, would one of you like to tackle that one about culverts in Grimsby? Yeah, so I'll start. Steve, you can add if you'd like. Um, sure. I mean, so there's, there's not one general answer. There's 42 culverts within the study area. Some of them would be undersized. In other words, they can't convey the 100-year flow. Typically, we identify them. Um, Normally, in a normal course, what they're done is if and when a road is upgraded, this information is useful to the municipality to put in the proper size of culvert. So they're typically upgraded or increased in capacity once a road reconstruction project's done. And when that's done, it would reduce the spillage and, and reduce the floodplain. Thank you. Steve, anything to add? Yep. No, hit the nail on the head. Okay, great. Um, so another question, and Dave, again, Dave Monder, maybe this one's <clears> best put to you. Does monitoring occur after a storm event to check the model's accuracy? So do you actually check what you've you know done on the computer with what's happening in terms of real world events? Um, yeah, so in some cases you will do flow monitoring, and that's used to try and help you maybe more accurately reflect the numbers you're trying to come up with. In this case, due to time limitations, we did not do flow monitoring. It is always something that you can do in the future just to double check, to double check the, the results that we have, yeah. But maybe I can add on to that, okay. you know, um, let, let's hope it never happens. But if 
we get a hundred year storm event and it hits one of one or, or multiple water courses in in Grimsby or Lincoln for that matter. Um, you know, we have the luxury of weather radar and, and our uh, climate stations that that help tell us, you know, what the intensity of this storm is. Um, Conservation Authority staff will certainly go on out after that storm event and uh, scout around, take a look at the debris lines, chat with the uh, municipality and the residents, and trying to understand the the magnitude of that event. And so, yes, yes, absolutely, we'll. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dave. So we've got a few more questions. And just a reminder to everybody, we're at about 7.30 right now. We'll look to wrap up in not too long um, from this point. I don't think we'll go quite to eight. But again, if there are any other essential questions you would like to share, um, please do send them through the Q&A function to the NPCA chat moderator. And again, there have been some terrific ones already, uh, but the team is happy um, to explore others with you. And there are a couple more. Um, let me share them with the group now. Someone is asking and wondering, when would the new floodplain lines go into effect? Um, and are things that have already been done on the land, would they be grandfathered in? So if I'm imagining they're thinking if there's all, you know, a shed that already exists and now it's found to be within the floodplain, would it be allowed to stay there and so forth? So um, I don't know a Steve or a David Deleuze question, um, but would either of you like to jump in? When would the flood, the new floodplain lines go into effect and are things already on properties so to yep. speak, grandfathered in. Thank, thanks, Glenn. Maybe um, what we'll do, uh, Dave, I'll answer, David, I'll answer the first part of the question. And if you can uh, maybe chat about the, the grandfathering and, and how the policies treat that. And so the intent, this, this draft floodplain mapping, what we want to do, we're holding these public sessions, one tonight, one last night. Um, we're going to uh, collect all the, the comments from the public. Um, were uh, you can provide a comment email to me directly or onto our project website until January 15th. After that, we'll amalgamate all that and we're going to bring the results of, of this, these public meetings to the Conservation Authority's Public Advisory Committee. That's at the end of January. We're going to present what we found, what we heard, the questions that were asked. And from there, after that, we're going to take to our board um, a motion to have the board adopt, formally adopt the floodlines. Now, until that happens, until the Conservation Authority's Board of Directors formally adopts a floodplain mapping study, uh, it has no status. It's only after they adopt at a board meeting, then we're able to use those updated floodlines to administer our, our floodplain regulation and the associated policies. Um, David, I'll turn it over to you to talk about um, the policies, grandfathering stuff already in the floodplain. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So once the floodplain mapping comes into effect, so when our board adopts it and it um, becomes in effect, now anything that's existing as of that day is essentially grandfathered. So for example, you have a house and shed in your backyard and all of a sudden maybe the shed and everything is uh, and part of your backyard is now all of a sudden in a floodplain and it wasn't before. So that shed is fine. It's not all of a sudden illegal. You don't have to remove it, but anything you want to do in the future, um, that has to get approval from the Conservation Authority and it has to be in accordance with their policies. So if you find uh, through this exercise that you now have floodplain in your property that wasn't there um, prior to, you probably uh, may want to get in touch with us to find out specifically, especially if you have any plans for projects next summer, um, you may want to get in touch with us to find out what the implications are specifically to your project. So, David, this is a related question. Somebody has asked, how does the current floodplain um, line mapping update affect building applications that, and this is important, that have already been approved. So the buildings might not be built, but the applications have been approved. How would these new flood lines um, impact those things? Yeah, again, another good question. And uh, those are tricky situations, right? It's almost like a, a bit of a, a 
chicken and an egg situation of which comes first, but as long as there is a valid building permit in existence at the time our mapping is adopted, then that would essentially be sufficient to grandfather it in. So let's say, for example, somebody's applied um, beginning of February next year, they get um, a building permit for a project. They don't start construction until maybe April. In the meantime, our floodplain mapping gets adopted and comes into effect. Again, as long as you have that valid building permit, because the Conservation Authority would have been involved in the review of that building permit. So if we had issued a previous approval to say, okay, it's it's good, again, we will honor that. Now, that's on the understanding that you may now be in a floodplain and you may want to take that into consideration in the construction of your building that you may now have to factor in some flood proofing that you didn't originally uh, factor before. Um, if that's the case, you may, again, you may want to sit down and have a conversation with us before you go headstrong into constructing the building to find out what should be done, you know, what other alternatives may be um, available to alleviate some of that flooding. So, again, get in, if you're in that situation, I would, again, recommend getting in touch with us. Thanks, David. Let's get uh, Dave Monder back in. Um, Dave, in your presentation, you had talked a little bit about broadening and perhaps deepening water courses and the impact that that might have on the flood lines. Um, someone is wondering, how do you ensure that making those changes doesn't make things worse for somebody else elsewhere when you go about doing that? So, so how do you cover that off, Dave? Um, well, generally, anybody who does work in the floodplain would require a permit from the authority. And without getting into details, the authority has a certain um, methodology they follow to ensure that you do not increase flood lines upstream. But if you're widening or deepening something, you're generally not going to adversely impact people upstream. So, again, it's case specific, but anybody who does work in a floodplain would need a permit. And the, the, the Conservation Authority would look at how that work was done to make sure there's no adverse impacts upstream. Thank you. And someone else is wondering, and, and it might be a very simple answer of no here, but let's ask it. Um, what impact do rising lake water levels have on floodplain mapping, if any? So I, I can take that one. So the assumption is that the 100-year storm that hits, um, say, Lake Ontario 31 or, or one of our Grimsby tributaries. The assumption is, is the lake Lake Ontario would be at its average level. Now, we know that the lake in 2017, 2019 has, has been very high. And typically, if that 100-year storm would hit, then there'd be an impact, usually around the mouth of, um, of uh, where that water course drains into Lake Ontario. That's a very localized um, thing. But so you know, not only do we have the 100-year floodplain mapped on uh, uh, the tributaries, but we also have the 100-year floodplain mapped for Lake Ontario as well. So when you get closer to the mouth of the watercourse, when you get closer to the lake, you actually have two floodplains that you have to worry about, and there'll be a point where one supersedes the other. So one more question, Stephen, perhaps this one best goes to you as well. Somebody was wondering, how does the NPCA identify boundaries for floodplain mapping? So how did you determine, like, you know, that, that you're going to look at Grimsby and Lincoln as opposed to a larger area for, for a particular study or initiative? No, thanks for the question, Glenn. So. I mentioned that we were looking to provide floodplain mapping to watercourses that didn't have it. Uh, when we looked to uh, update the floodplain mapping, we looked around and and said, "Okay, what areas what areas um, have uh, experienced um, urban uh, development pressure? In what areas had things changed?" Um, and we looked uh, quickly identified Grimsby and Lincoln. They had similar characteristics. 
um, same general geographic location, same general type of water course, um, same urbanization pressures kind of walking down from the GTA. So that's that's what's really grouped them together. Thank you. And um, a question for David DeLuce, and we had a similar one last night when we were doing this for Lincoln. Somebody is wondering how some of the initiatives of the provincial government might impact what you're doing here. And more specifically, they're asking whether Bill 229 will impact floodplain mapping and future projects that you might be undertaking. Um, David, do you want to jump in on that one? Sure, and um, just for the benefit of everybody in the audience, uh, Bill 229 refers to um, it's essentially the budget bill that was uh, brought before um, or, um, uh, the Ontario Legislature back at the beginning of November. And one of the, as part of that bill, there was a proposed change or changes, I should say, to the Conservation Authorities Act. And some of those changes are pretty significant. Now, with respect to our floodplain mapping, this particular project and all floodplain mapping going forward. Uh, I'll say right now, based on our reading of it, there's no direct impacts per se as a result of that bill. Now, there's still a future regulation uh, to be developed in which the province may look at um, modifying how we regulate uh, our regulated areas. But one area that it could be impacted is the province is now putting into place something called a minister zoning order. Now, on the planning side of things under the Planning Act, that's been around for a while. Uh, and essentially what that does is allows the province to step in and say, okay, we're going to take this section of land, we're going to zone it for a specific use and takes the municipality out of the equation. Now, conservation authorities have sort of escaped that for a while. And now the new changes they're proposing will add that sort of uh, tool for the province uh, to the Conservation Authorities Act. So what that means is the province could come in and say, NPCA, you have to issue a permit for whatever it could be. It may be a, a new factory. It could be a new high rise development um, in one of our regulated areas. And we don't have any choice but to issue that permit. Now, as part of that uh, new change, they are talking about uh, giving conservation authorities the ability to still impose conditions to help mitigate impacts as a result of the development. But we, even if the development is contrary to our policy, so we mentioned earlier that there's some things that we uh, prohibit, the province has explicitly stated in the, um, the changes that the permit would still be, would still have to be issued. So that's an example of where a province in theory could come in and say, NPC, you have to issue a permit for this development in a floodplain. And we wouldn't have any say in the matter. We could try and impose conditions to help offset or mitigate the impacts, but um, we have no choice in whether or not the permit can be issued. Gotcha. Thanks, David. Um, so someone else has um, asked, I think, a really interesting question. They've noted that we've been talking tonight a lot about 100-year storms but we haven't been talking about ice buildup, for example, in the spring and the impact that that has on the floodplain models. And people are wondering, is that taken into account? The ice, the flood, the large amounts of snow, is that part of the modeling? Is that a concern? Um, Dave or Dave Monder or Steve, either of you wanna jump in on that one? Dave, you want to take it or you want me? I, I can start it. You can add to it. I mean, um, the methodology we use is a fairly prescriptive one. It's it's fairly standard throughout the province. And this method does look primarily at what we would refer to as a, a summer thunderstorm event, an extreme event. Steve, you may know the specifics in this area. There are typically annual problems with respect to to ice and snow buildup and backing up of culverts. I don't know the extent here, but usually the worst case event is a, a large, rare summer thunderstorm. That's right. Um, so right off the hop, we're looking at what is the extent of the floodplain when we get a lot of a lot of water rushing across the ground. Now that water that four inches in in 12 hours generally it could be the result of a an intense summer thunder shower it could be the result of a rapid snow melt um, one of the things that the conservation authority does every winter twice a month 
and we go on out and measure the snowpack at a number of areas throughout our watershed, we determine how much water is in that snowpack and should a rapid melt occur, what water equivalent or what, what rainfall event would that equate to? Okay, because I know in this, in Niagara, you know, when I was a kid, we seen snow from November to to February, March. It's it's not like that anymore. We get we get snow on the ground. We got melt. We got freeze. We got thaw. It just happens time and time again. We're well aware of this. So we want to chart the extent of the floodplain, understanding how much water is either falling or melting. Now, that being said, ice jams, debris jams. You get a bunch of branches in a culvert, it starts backing stuff up. Those are wild cards. Those are wild cards that that we can't hope to predict. Now we can study ice, you know, that that's a different study. <laughs> um, but in this case, uh, the intent was was to map the floodplain as a result of uh, a large amount of water flowing across the landscape. Thanks, Steve. Um, so let me thank our expert responders for addressing the questions and also thank all of you for your thoughtful and insightful questions. They're much appreciated. We're into our last uh, 10 minutes or so, and we want to talk a little bit about next steps and do a couple of other things. And again, though we've been focusing on questions in the last 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so, please keep in mind that you do have other options to share questions and comments. And we mentioned earlier that the NPCA really strongly invites you to visit the project website. I won't review that long address again, but do go there. There's some good and important information. And of course, you can contact Steve Miller directly. Again, he's the NPCA Senior Manager of Water Resources, and he can be reached at smiller at n pca.ca and again that's your best bet is to go to steve if you have any very specific property questions if he can't help you out with them he will certainly refer you uh, to others who can um, you can also submit comments and questions by surface mail if you want you can drop them off in person as well at the npca offices um, which if you're not aware of the address it's 250 Thorold Road West in Welland. So again, this uh, session was scheduled to go until eight and to be respectful of your time, we'll look to wrap things up shortly. Just before I invite Steve to describe next steps and to share any kind of final observations that he might want to uh, offer. Again, I wanna thank everybody for participating. A special thank you to those who shared questions. They are much appreciated. I'd also like to again, thank all of our elected officials and NPCA board members who may have participated this evening, um, both for joining us and for their interest in the topic, but also for their ongoing and valued service to the community, which is again, much appreciated. Um, from my point of view as a facilitator, it's been a real pleasure um, working with a group that is obviously very thoughtful and insightful. And I think that was shown through the caliber of the questions that was offered this evening. So I'll come back and wrap things up in a moment, but Steve, over to you for a very quick description of uh, next steps and any final observations you might want to share. No, thanks, Glenn. Once again, the next steps were um, receiving public comments until January 15th. Uh, after that period, we'll amalgamate the comments. We'll present what we found to the Conservation Authority's Public Advisory Committee at the end of January. And then after that, look to uh, present the entire project and what we heard from the public to the Conservation Authority's board, looking for their adoption of this floodplain mapping study um, at their February board meeting. Um, in the meantime, I encourage folks, if they have any uh, questions, take a look at the website. The report's posted up there. The maps are posted up there. You can use the uh, Is My House in the Floodplain tool, or you can give me a call. We uh, invite your uh, invite and look forward to your, your questions, comments, and participation.
Great. Thanks, Steve. So again, at risk of sounding a bit like a broken record and echoing what Steve just said, um, just before I adjourn the session, I really do encourage you, if you have the time and you are so inclined, to take the opportunity to visit the NPCA project webpage for the initiative. As Steve mentioned, there's a lot of good information there. There are some good tools um, you can use around, you know, relating to, to properties and so forth. It's a good way as well to provide any additional questions or comments. So I'll conclude by saying thank you again to the various personnel who made this session possible. Thank you to all of you for your participation. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Stay safe. Good night.